Thanks for that, Krusty. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I understand MPAs are a bit of a hot topic in WA, and they're kind of a hot topic globally, really. And um, the point of view that I want to come at uh, to tonight is whether they're working in terms of fisheries management. So they're being established in a lot of places around the world, and we scientists have kind of sold everyone on this idea that they're going to improve fisheries. The fishermen quite rightly tell us, well, prove it. And we haven't been able to do such a good job of that. But what I'm going to present tonight is um, some of the first evidence that examines that question directly. So I'd like to start off first with just describing a bit of um, basic fish biology, which I think will be important in just sort of understanding how we think marine reserves and marine protected areas are going to work. Now, in the context of this talk, when I say MPA, a marine protected area, I'm talking about a place where no fishing is allowed. But there are lots of different kinds of MPAs. So this is just one. But So here we have the life of a fish. And I think it would make a really good movie because there's lots of intrigue, murder, mayhem, and everything else going on. <laughs> so here we have a very popular target um, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and throughout the Indo-Pacific, the coral trout. We've got two coral trout sitting there on the reef happily, a male and a female. Now when they get serious about each other and commit, <laughs> um, they tend to uh, reproduce. And when they do this, they actually produce hundreds of thousands to millions of tiny little larvae. And these larvae leave the reef environment and spend about 30 days or so um, growing and developing out in the open waters away from reefs, which is a high predation environment. Now, those hundreds of thousands to millions that start off, very few of them make it. So we think in a lot of cases, 99% of them are dying on the way. That could be because of starvation, predation by other things that are trying to eat them. For the lucky few that actually make it through this 30 days out in the open water, they'll find a coral reef to settle on, and in most cases, they'll pretty much stay there for the rest of their life. The distance that they travel between when they're those tiny little larvae on the left and when they actually make it through that, that gauntlet and, and end up on a reef has been a big mystery to us because we've, we've struggled with ways to really um, measure that directly. So that's one aspect of, of fish that are important in, in terms of how MPAs are supposed to work. The other thing that is really nice about fish is that size actually matters. Um, as humans, we say it doesn't, but in fish, it really does. So here's, a, here's an example. You've got a 40-centimeter coral trout, and that 40-centimeter coral trout will produce about 350,000 larvae. Okay? Again, most of these things are going to die. A 50-centimeter coral trout is going to produce about a million and then a 60 centimeter trout is going to produce about 3 million. So it's not a linear relationship. As you get big, you produce a heap more larvae than you do when you're smaller. Okay? So those are the two important aspects of sort of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Now, let's just talk about MPAs now. And there's the provocative sort of title up at the top, how MPAs work in theory. Because to this point, a lot of it has been theory. So let's say you've got this situation where people are allowed to fish wherever they want. So all the fishermen are happy, we're all happy, and that's kind of what the distribution of coral trout looks like in, the, in those two areas. Now, either we decide collectively or someone decides for us against our will that we're going to actually set up um, a marine protected area. So we're going to choose this place on the lower right as a marine protected area. We're going to ban fishing. And then in that upper left area, we're going to have that remain open to fishing, okay? Now, if everyone obeys the rules, um, then what will happen through time is you'll get more fish inside the protected area and those fish will tend to be bigger on average. Um, and this isn't, you know, particularly controversial. We know that if you stop fishing and stop removing fish, they'll end up being more there eventually. And we've seen this effect demonstrated throughout the world. Um, and this is really, really well documented as an effect of, of a well-protected uh, marine reserve no-take fishing area. Fishermen say, well, that doesn't do us any good because we can't fish there. We can fish there. So what good is that MPA to us? Good question. Now, in order for the fishermen and the fishing um, community to benefit from these marine protected areas like we've been telling them they will, there has to be one of two things going on. The first way that an MPA can supply fish to a fishing area is through the movement of adult fish from the protected area to the fishing zone. Okay. So the idea here is that as you get more and more crowded inside that no-take zone, that fish will start to leave and look for greener pastures, places with bigger backyards. This is relatively easy to test. Okay? You can go and catch fish inside the no-take MPA. You can tag them. You can see where they go. Right? That's relatively easy to do. Now, the second way that an MPA can supply a fishing area is by exporting larvae. 
okay, to the fishing grounds. This is a lot harder to test because these things are really, really tiny and putting a tag in them, how do you do it, right? We figured out recently in the last sort of 10 years ways to try and attack this question because it's so important to try and understand how these MPAs might be supporting fishing communities. We do have quite a bit of evidence for that top effect, the movement of fish outside of MPAs to fishing grounds. That tends to occur over relatively short distances, four or five hundred meters, maybe a kilometer. Fish tend to be homebodies, so they don't move very far. But because these larvae are spending so much time out in the open water, there's a really big potential for them to go somewhere. But where do they go? So we've figured out some ways to test this. And to do this, we, we looked at a, a group of islands in the Keppel Islands um, on the, in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And the Keppel Islands has a mix of no-take MPAs and fishing areas. Uh, and that's true all throughout the Great Barrier Reef. And you see the typical effect, right? Inside the no-take zone, you have about two to two and a half times more coral trout, and those coral trout tend to be bigger than adjacent fishing areas. Now, what we've done to try and understand whether those MPAs support fishing areas. So here we've got our green zones, our, our no-take MPAs, right? And they protect, in this Keppel Island zone, about 28% of the coral reefs. The coral reefs are those sort of gray, um, stifled areas. Now, what we've done is we worked with a recreational fishing community who jumped at the opportunity, surprisingly, to help us fish green zones. Um, and this was actually a really, really good exercise. Not only um, it, it helped us out to do the research, but it also gave them the opportunity to see, are these things really working? And so they helped us um, hook and line catch uh, coral trout inside some of these reserves. We took a small fin clip from each adult. We then sent a team of researchers out to the reefs within 30 kilometers of these green zones into the fishing areas and took samples of juveniles. Okay, and we took a small tissue sample from them. Now what we did is we basically applied a, um, a DNA parentage analysis, right, similar to human parentage analysis or paternity, paternity analysis, where we compare the DNA of the adults that we sampled inside green zones, inside those no-take MPAs, with the DNA of the juveniles that we collected from all throughout that area. Now in the Keppels, the, the um, no-take MPAs protect about 28% of the coral reefs in that region. What we found um, and again, this is some of the first evidence of MPAs actually supplying fisheries, that more than half of all the juvenile coral trout in the fishing grounds came from adults that were living inside the no-take reserves. So, are MPAs working and do fishers benefit? In the Keppel Islands, it appears they are, they are working the way we want them to. So this is a, an effect within 30 kilometers of the MPA. So local fishermen who have to give up fishing grounds because the government zoned these no-take MPAs and said they're going to help, them to help the fisheries out, are the same ones who are benefiting from those MPAs. So the larvae aren't being transported to East Timor or something. They're staying really close to these same areas where the MPAs are, which is a very surprising result. So as these MPAs become, as long as everyone's obeying the rules and the fish numbers continue to increase inside those MPAs, we might expect to see an even greater influence of these MPAs to support local fisheries. So this is a really good news story. And some of the first evidence that all this stuff that we've been telling fishermen for so long about how MPAs are going to support their fisheries, it actually works, at least here. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you all again for coming tonight and um, open it up to questions.